Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, in spite of all of the challenges, we are still in the land of the living. That's Amen. all of us. Still got a roof over our head, too. Got a roof over our head and a mind to call on the name Amen. of the Lord. Amen. A whole lot of folk don't have that mind. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We are continuing with our theme, the works and life of Jesus. We are on message 27 of 42 messages on the works and life. Of Jesus. Our subject for today is the wicked husband men. The wicked husband men. You know, a lot of us call uh, this kind of uh, sermon negative. Uh, it's all throughout the teachings of Jesus, back to back, back to back. But but we, we here's what the Bible says about uh, the people of God. The Bible says that the people of God say to the ministers, preach unto us smooth things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. Tell us what we want to hear. Tell us that we pretty much are all right. Tell us that everything is going to be all right. You know, well, well, that's not the way the Bible teaches as a rule of thumb. You know, um, there's a group called the Navy SEALs, and there are, mm -hmm. are uh, several other special forces missions, <laughs> and uh, they don't teach them to think and act like, well, everything is gonna be all right, you know. Don't don't worry, don't don't, don't you ain't gotta be upset. Be, be, just be calm. Everything is gonna be all right. It, it, that's not the way they train them. They are always behind enemy lines. They've always got to watch out. They've always got to watch their step. They've always got to be careful. Otherwise, they're going to get killed and not accomplish the mission. And so it is with us. We certainly are behind enemy lines. And we have to be sober, serious. And it's not time to just preach smooth things. It's just okay. Just, let's, just, let's just celebrate. That's all we need to do. Don't worry about nothing. Don't be concerned. Don't be watchful. God help us. Now listen, when we study the Bible, and we see the state and condition of the majority referred to in the Bible, we tend not to want to include ourselves. <laughs> you know, that's those other folk. No one wants to be wrong. No one wants to be guilty. No one wants to be condemned. So we choose to think it's all right. All right. Yet we must be careful, folk, not to presume or assume we are innocent and we are safe and we are right and we are always completely faithful. We got to be careful when we draw that conclusion. So now listen, folk. Here's a fact. Here's a fact. Listen carefully. If we are a truly born again child of God, if we are a true called and chosen disciple of Christ, if we are actually sent by heaven and sent from heaven, then we are also one of God's husbandmen. If we are really one of God's remnant body parts, then we are also one of God's husbandmen, which means we are one of God's land workers. That's what the word means when you look it up in the Greek. Mm. Uh, or farmer. Mm. We are a land worker or farmer. Mm. Thus, we are those who work in God's vineyard producing fruit. Mm. The emphasis is on producing fruit. All must be fruitful. Now, we are either, as husbandmen, we are either diligent or slothful. There's no in-between. We are either full-time or part-time. Mm. That's right. We are either good or bad. We are either righteous or wicked. There is no in-between. And also, the main tools that we have to work with in order to produce fruit are the gifts of God's Spirit, mm. Our time, our talents, our efforts, and our money. Oh, uh, how do we use them? 
and we either use them in God's vineyard for Christ's sake, or we use them in God's vineyard for our own benefit and for our own profit and for our own comfort and for our own pleasure and for our own convenience, and then declare you have to do it, all right? And be sure, each of us will one day have to give an account to the householder concerning the fruit we have or have not produced and reaped. Ah, uh, let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you for what you are and who you are, what you've done, what you're now doing, and what you will do, Lord. Great is our God. We praise your name. You've covered us. You've changed us. Lord, help us to prove to be faithful. You have done everything possible that an infinite God can do. And will continue to do that. Lord, help us to prove to be faithful. Help us not to buy the lies that are out there. That lull us to sleep and make us feel that we can serve the world. And serve God a little bit sometimes and we'll be all right. Help us, Lord. We can look at TV for 50 times longer than we read our Bibles, but we'll be all right. We can be concerned with ourselves and the world and the cares of this world and pray for a few minutes, if that, out of the whole day, and we'll be all right. Only thing we have to do is say we believe in Jesus and go to the club meeting once a week and maybe do a little bit in the church and that's serving the Lord. Forget about the folk uh, out in our neighborhoods and whom we uh, uh, be among in the stores and in the places of business. We don't, we don't have to bother much there, but just do a little something in the church and that's sufficient. Lord, help us, Lord, to come from under the delusions we are under this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to talk about the wicked husband men. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something that's true. Unfortunate, but it's true. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The Bible states in many different ways that most are wicked husband men. Most. Uh, the majority are not good and faithful ones. Now, that's just a reality. Uh, and that means that we, we have a choice. Let's look at this narrative in the Bible that we're going to uh, try to highlight today. And it's gonna, we're going to start with Matthew 21 uh, and verse 33. It's going to set the stage. And what, is it, what does it say here? This is Jesus talking. Here, another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. This householder did a lot of work. He did the work. Just that. He did the work. But he let it out to husbandmen. Uh, that's you and I. And went to a far country went back to his father, which is in heaven. The householder is God, is Jesus. Mm -hmm. He planted a, a vineyard. Uh, he wants to work this earth, this lost, doomed world. He's uh, created a, a setting for us to labor in. He hedged it about. You know, he's got his law, he's got grace, he's got righteousness, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he has it about. And he dig the wine press, you know, that sanctification process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be painful. Mm -hmm. You might be squeezed and pushed and burned and whatever it needs to, mm -hmm. to cleanse you, but, but, but it has to happen. Mm -hmm. And he built the tower, he built the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he let it out to husbandmen, that's us, mm -hmm. members of his body. And then he went into a far country. Now, now, he didn't do that just for us to sit around. 
maybe and look at television and work and make an honest dollar so we can accumulate the things of this world. That's, that's not why he did it, you know. Now, here's what it says in Matthew 21, 34. It sort of reveals the purpose of it all. What does it say there? And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. His servants. Uh, Jesus himself, himself comes. That The angels come. You know, uh, his servants are faithful, and God knows who they are, faithful servants of the Lord. All right? They, they, they tend to the fruit. Mark 12 and verse 2 says it this way. And at the season he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. All right, now, uh, uh, one day uh, God's going to want uh, uh, the fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, he's he's going to want the fruit. Yeah. Now, uh, as husbandmen, what are we going to do? What have we done? Because in, in Jesus' day, the husbandmen who were set over God's vineyard and the wine press and the tower, they wanted to keep control. And they killed Jesus. And they, they set out to kill the disciples. And Jesus said one day, which of the prophets have not your father slain? Which of the prophets hath not your fathers killed? That spirit is still in the church. A little different in application, you know. It's still there. Somebody who really wants to be a worker in the church, too often they're criticized. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Because in Matthew 21 and verse 35, what do the, does the husbandman do to the servants? And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. This, this, this is an amazing thing. He's talking about the church. He's talking about his people. The husbandmen, those whom he left in charge to bring forth fruit in season. And what did they do when God sent servants to them? They beat one, they killed another, they stoned another. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. You know, too often, not all the time, but all too often, there are certain folk in the church who think they own the church. They've been there a long time and they want things to go their way or no way at all. They're going to beat folk. They're going to beat their ideas and their, their plans. They're going to beat, kill, and stone their, their character and their motives and their purposes. You know, they got to stay in power. They have to be in control. They have to be the ones up front. Same old folk down through the years. You let somebody else come along, they're going to get rid of them. I hope you hear me. Somebody come in and they are a real worker and they have uh, perhaps a, a different way of doing it, but they're successful. Instead of getting on board, they don't want to do all this stuff. They don't want to do it any different. And 99% and, and of the time, those folk under their leadership, the church has always constantly been been uh, diminishing. It's, it has always been lessening. You know how it is. The same old three or four folk, 10 or 12 folk, 15 or 20 folk. For years, they're just getting older and older and dying off. No, no real progress. And they're going to beat anybody who comes along and tries to get in their place. I'm talking about God sent them. God sent servants. Beat them up. Kill them, stone them. Don't want to hear their ideas. Don't want to hear their plans. They're going to impugn their character. They're going to distort their motives. They're going to uh, 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 castigate their purposes. This is a real problem. And what does Jesus say? The householder dead, Matthew 21, 36. 
again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. That's why they always in power. Same old folk. They going to somehow put aside any new person who comes. Unless, of course, the new person comes in and just blends right in with them, you know. Basically have church, talk evangelism, talk all this outreach. Don't really never do it. And the church doesn't grow. And if they're willing to come and sit and fit in with that, they, they, they're wonderful, great. But, of course, the same old people got to stay in control, you know. And the church never grows. They always complain about, oh, we need to grow, we need to grow. But the same old stuck in the mud folk are in charge. And it don't grow. It don't grow. And they'll wage war against anybody who comes along, whom God sends to bless his people. And then at the last, the Bible says that uh, the householder says this, God says this, Matthew 21, 37 to 39. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Now, Jesus says, Jesus says, If they do it unto you, they've done it unto me. I've listened to uh, a number of folk in the churches on this line who are genuinely seeking to serve the Lord. And they, they got more problems than a little bit out of the folk in the church who are not doing nothing. <laughs> but they want to criticize and castigate and uh, put down and Slow you down and tell you how wrong you are and how you ought to do this and how you ought to do that. And Jesus said that when they do it to you, they've done it to me. This is a, a solemn thing that God is saying about too many church people, especially from the leadership on down. This is Jesus talking. He's not just being negative and... Uh, uh, or trying to beat you up, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's foolish talk in my book. But uh, at any rate, they, they're not just trying to, he's not just trying to do that. He's telling us what reality is. He, he's telling us what the church did to him. Church people, mm -hmm. religious people, starting from the leaders. This is reality. Now, there's a question that, Jesus asked those who were listening to his parable, what does it say in Matthew 21, 40? When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? What should he do to, them hus to those husbandmen? When the Lord of the vineyard shall come, Jesus asked, what will he do unto those husbandmen? He's asking the very people who are doing it. That's what he's asking. What should he do? What's fair? What's just? What, what do they deserve? What should he do unto those husbandmen? And they thought about it. They thought about it. Didn't necessarily perceive that he was talking about them, not yet. Their eyes were holding on that point. And so what did they answer him? Matthew 21, 41, what does it say? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Which will render him the fruit in their season. One of the problems in the church today is people don't want to do too much. They want to be able to do enough to say that we've done something, but they only want it to be a little, only take a little bit of money, only take a little bit of time, only take a little bit of our efforts and talents. That's what they want. You come in to something that's going to be all consuming, forget it, man. You're going to get a whooping. They're going to kill your ideas. They're going to stone your character, your ideas. You got to be kidding. It's overboard. We don't want to do it. 
and they will begin to dislike you, hate you, have nothing good to say about you. That's sad. That was the, the, the situation in Jesus' day. Let's look at it now. That was the case in Jesus' day. Those scribes and Pharisees, they were the leader and they wanted to stay the leaders. The people looked up to them and that's the way they wanted to keep it. There was a certain group in the church who were used to a certain position and they uh, looked. They would set themselves in an array of anybody else who's trying to get into that group who isn't uh, accepted by them and who has the same ideas and focus that they have. Stone them, beat them, kill them. That, 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 that's the way the Bible terms it. And too often it is the same today. You come in and be a pew warmer, you all right. You come in and just do a little bit. Just do a little bit. Don't cost no money. Maybe a little, but that's it, you know. Doesn't take much time. Maybe not, Maybe no time. Just mail something, you know. You know, just, just say we praying. And then go home and look at TV. You know, that kind of stuff. Go out and knock on doors. You got to be kidding. People might shoot you and this and that and all that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff we talk. People don't want you knocking on the door. It's a different time. We're lazy. That's what the problem is. But we ain't going to have to give an account, folks. He will, and this is what those who are doing it are saying. He will miserably destroy those wicked men. Well, they were talking about themselves. And he will let out the vineyard. To other husbandmen, that's exactly what God will do. Which will render him the fruits in their seasons. That's the, God does not have to use you. He does not have to use me. He does not have to use any group who, have, who has a certain name. But we think God is constrained by denominationalism. That's a lie. That's the fatal mistake that the, the uh, ancient Israel <coughs> believed. God has to use us. God's got to work within the confines of us. He has to do it. He has promised he would do it. He has to do it. And they were rejected. And God brought in the true Israel. <laughs> those who were genuinely born again and did God's work and will. While those who should have been and who claimed to be and who were by birth the people of God were rejected. That's what happened. History always repeats itself. In Matthew 21, 43, what does Jesus say to those folk who he's talk, talking to and teaching? Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now we don't believe that's possible. We don't, I, I'm one of the remnant. We don't believe that's possible. God has to use us. That's what we think. We're just like the Jews of old. He has to use us. He does not have to use us. We want to sit around and be slothful husband men and do next door to nothing and or nothing and don't grow, no fruit. You know, some people have been in the church a year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And they barely can count nobody they brought into the church. That's the problem. God promises you you'll be fruitful. And we want to make all kinds of excuses and theories about why we brought nobody into the church. Nobody. You hear me? Nobody. The kingdom of God, Jesus is telling those who were the chosen ones, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And given unto a nation that brings forth the fruit. It's still the same today. The same Jesus has the same word for us today. And in Matthew 21, 45 to 46, what does the Bible teach us that uh, Jesus said and the others realized? And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. When they sought to lay hands on him, <laughs> you beat some and uh, stone some and kill others. They were ready to kill him right then and there. And he had just told them the parable. 
We are stone persons with the, our words, stone their character. Oh, they're this, they're this, they're a fanatic, they're this. They, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what to, uh, how to uh, do it. That's all because they don't want to do it. Chuck, you're disturbing our peace. Mm -hmm. And when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they understood that he spake of them. Sometimes you're up preaching and people say, uh, you, you were talking about me. Well, you didn't call their name. Their own conscience. The Holy Ghost reveals that that's them. And they're mad with you about it, man. You, 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 you're preaching uh, stuff that you ought not preach. You're using the pulpit uh, incorrectly. You're pointing out sin, which I practice openly, and I'm mad with you. You're talking about me. That's not the way you should use the pulpit. Oh, sit him down. Get him out of here. Vote him out. Vote her out. It's a real problem in the church today. And it was a real problem in the church in Jesus' day. Are you going to prove to be a, a faithful and a good husband, man? You've got to bring forth the fruit. And God does that. God does that in you and through you, but you can't be a part-time and a half-stepping husband, man, and think you're going to be fruitful. If you're not fruitful, it's nobody's fault but yours. Caught up with the world and the cares of the world and the concerns of the world and the flesh and carnal things and temporal things, and you expect to be fruitful when you put in uh, drop in the bucket of your time and your talent and your effort and your money into the kingdom of God. You put a drop in the bucket in and you expect to be fruitful. You're not. Mm. You're not. That's why we can be in church for a whole year. And that's a long time. Or five years and 10 years and 15 years and 20 years and bringing nobody into the church. I mean, absolutely nobody. That should not be. Mm. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's pointing to a spiritual condition. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, don't even know it. Think you're safe. Think you're all right. You're attending a club meeting. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, help us, Lord. The lessons throughout the gospel, to a large degree, is the same lesson over and over and over and over again. And some will never learn it. They don't want to learn it. They just want to be all right. They just want the world in heaven, too. They just want to live the way they want to live and be left alone, but receive eternal rewards in the end. And Lord, help us to wake up to our condition. Help us to be genuine husband men, faithful ones, diligent ones, who bring forth the fruit, who bring forth the fruit. Help us, Lord, so that when the householder comes, we can give to him the fruit that we've labored for and been successful in because of his preparation and his work and his working in us and through us in spite of us. Help us, Lord, this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, saints. Straightforward. Mm. What am I? A good husband?